Good morning and welcome. My name is Rachel Browner. I am the program coordinator for OneOp, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session on reducing your risk of cognitive decline as you age. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you just a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides that we're sharing. If you're unable to see them or have any other difficulties, please email us at contact at oneop.org for tech support. And if you can, I would greatly appreciate if everyone that's on, go ahead and let us know where you're joining us from in that chat. That's going to be a way for us to communicate back and forth today. So if you can, let's go ahead and practice a little bit in that chat um, box option and just let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, maybe if there's more than one of you in your office, it kind of makes this platform a little bit more personable and um, gives us a chance to get to know you and, and see where everyone's joining us from as well. So I appreciate those of you that are going ahead and typing in that chat. Um, that is going to be a way to communicate throughout today. So if you have any questions or comments for myself as the moderator or our presenters, um, please feel free to ask those questions or, or pose those comments in that chat as well. All right, so to embed though, if some of you are having any difficulties with that chat, to embed the chat pod so you don't miss any links or conversations, just simply place your cursor over that shared slide. Um, you'll see them as a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen. From there, just click that chat bubble icon if you're having any issues finding that as well. Um, and then when typing questions or comments, please be sure um, to select the everyone from the response options drop down menu so everyone is able to view um, your questions or comments in that chat pod. And note the slides and resources are available for download on the event page for today's session. And we'll be covering continuing education and information at the end of the webinar. So please stay tuned. We have lots of um, CE offerings for providers um, that are on today. So if you're interested, stay tuned to the very end on CE credits and just those general certificates of completion. And finally, closed captioning is available for this webinar. You can turn on the subtitles via the Zoom toolbar. All right, so thank you for joining us as we continue our partnership with the Department of Defense and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to expand the readiness, knowledge, and networks of the professionals supporting our military service members and their families. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our presenters for today. Um, if you are a reoccurring participant, these two familiar faces that you see on the screen and their lovely voices are not new to you. They have provided a couple of presentations um, over the years for our group, so we're excited to have them back in, in presenting today. Um, Dr. Jenna Anding is a professor and extension specialist in the Department of Nutrition at Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. She's a registered and licensed dietitian and has more than 20 years of experience in developing and evaluating extension education programs on topics that include food preservation, food safety, and nutrition. Um, and our second presenter is Mr. Andy Crocker. Andy is an Extension Program Specialist for Gerontology and Health at Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. And his focus is on the health and well-being of older adults. And his main role is to really support county extension agents for family and community health in their efforts to educate older adults, caregivers, and the professionals who serve them. So without further ado, I believe uh, Mr. Andy Crocker is going to be starting us off today. Thanks, Rachel, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to be with you this morning to talk to you about um, uh, reducing your risk of cognitive decline as you age. You're going to notice that we use the word reduce and not prevent because there's not a whole lot that we can do to prevent it, but what we can do is, is help uh, provide some tips and strategies to help you reduce your risk uh, of cognitive decline. And so I'm going to get us started this morning, and then we're going to pivot to Dr. Anding to talk to us about some nutritional um, concerns, and then um, we'll come back to me with some self-care and activities. But before we get started, and I don't want anybody to cheat, so put your pencils down for a second. Uh, I'll know if you cheated. 
Um, but I want you to remember three words for me, okay? I want you to remember house, lake, and shoe. Say them out loud to yourself, house, lake, and shoe. The people in your office are going to think you've lost it a little bit because you're saying things out loud, those three words that don't really make any sense or, or have anything um, uh, in common with one another. But house, lake, and shoe, and we're going to come back to those here in a little bit. So as I said, we're going to talk about some trends in aging and uh, what's normal and what's not. And then we're going to talk about what we can do to promote our brain health uh, as we age. And Dr. Andy is going to talk about diet. And then I'm going to talk about some uh, self-care activities that we can engage in to help uh, build our capacity. So let's talk about what, what is normal. And, and, and I'm going to say quote unquote normal, right? Because we're all different. We're all individual. And so uh, what normal is for me may not be what normal is for you. So let's, let's maybe go ahead and call that optimal, right? Um, so we all worry about our memory as we age. Um, and so let's talk about what happens with our brain as we age. So we can generally expect that as we grow older, that we may have some slowing in our cognitive performance. And where we mostly see that is with speed of recall. So you have more of those tippy of the tongue moments where you can't quite come up with a name or a song or, um, you know, you had a thought and then it, it kind of goes away and you're frustrated by that. Um, and some decrease in mental flexibility. So, you know, maybe not being able to juggle as many tasks at one time. Um, and I'll tell you right now, our brains weren't built to multitask. We kind of forced them to multitask um, as a consequence of, of our day-to-day -day lives, but um, we're not really built to do that. So, you know, arguably that decrease in mental flexibility may just kind of be uh, reverting back to, to normal. Um, for some positives, we we do see um, a maintenance of independence and in activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. And so an activity of daily living are the things that we have to do in order to, to live on our own. And so these are things like uh, toileting, transferring, uh, bathing, uh, feeding, things like that. And then instrumental activities of daily living are things that support all of those things. So, you know, being able to use the telephone or being able to go to the grocery store. So we don't we don't necessarily have to be able to do those things in order to maintain our independence, but it, it certainly helps. And then we, we generally retain our verbal abilities and vocabulary. Um, and, and so the things we know, the things we know we know, the things that are based on wisdom, judgment, experience, learning, tend to uh, stick around. Um, and, and just to go back to ADLs and IDA, ADLs, our inability to perform those instrumental activities of daily living typically precede an, an inability to perform our basic ADLs, right? So you may see someone that, you know, can't drive to get to the grocery store, which then may affect uh, nutrition. Um, and then the other thing with instrumental activities of daily living is there are some things you can look for. So generally when a caregiver or a, a an individual um, starts to notice a change in their memory, it's, it's with numeracy because numeracy is a higher level function than literacy. So, you know, it's that inability to pay a bill or inability to balance a checkbook or uh, inability to understand a bank statement or something like that. Maybe one of the first signs that we start to notice um, when uh, someone is, is starting to experience some kind of cognitive impairment. And of course, the cognitive impairment that everybody is is generally concerned about. Oh, so um, I've got a question in the chat that says, what is ADL and IADL? So an ADL is an activity of daily living and an IADL is an instrumental activity of daily living. And so again, the difference is an ADL is essential to our being able to live kind of independently and high function. And then IADL helps support those um, activities of daily living. Um, so dementia is this broad class of, of conditions that um, are generally progressive and cause cognitive and behavioral impairments. Um, and so dementia actually isn't just one thing. Um, dementia is like um, saying you're at Baskin Robbins for ice cream, but when you go in, there are many different types of ice cream in there. So dementia is a broad class of diseases that a lot of other 
um, conditions fall into. But what happens is we start to conflate this term with something like Alzheimer's disease. So I get a lot of questions about what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Well, Alzheimer's disease is a condition that falls under the category of dementia. So if we were being uh, really specific, we would probably call Alzheimer's disease dementia of the Alzheimer's type. And we'll talk about just in a, in a minute, the other types of dementia are out there. But one of the key takeaways from this is that there isn't just one type of dementia. There are many different types of dementia. Um, it's also important to take away that dementia is not a normal part of the aging process. So dementia is something going wrong. Um, and it's interesting because it hasn't been that long ago that dementia, uh, especially Alzheimer's disease, was a mystery. Um, it was only in the early 1900s that dementia was kind of demystified as something actually going wrong with the brain and not just some kind of imbalance in our uh, body chemistry or, um, you know, somebody just having a bad day. There was actually a, a physical cause for a, a uh, cognitive disorder. Um, so uh, keep that in mind as we go through the rest of our, our presentation here. Uh, dementia does generally impact older adults. Um, so uh, there are national estimates that show approximately 10% of individuals um, age 65 and to 75 have uh, some form of uh, dementia. Uh, if we make it to uh, age 85 and older, there are uh, some estimates that put that closer to 40 to 50 percent of those individuals. Um, and so another key takeaway here, an important thing to understand about dementia is our number one risk factor for developing some type of dementia is growing older. Um, now, there is increasing research that talks about lifestyle factors um, that can increase our risk for developing dementia in our older age. Um, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about today with uh, diet. Uh, but um, our number one risk factor is still increasing age. I mentioned previously that dementia is a broad class of diseases. And so you can see some of those diseases listed here on the, the chart. Alzheimer's disease does make up about 70% of dementia diagnoses, which is why we conflate the two terms so often. Um, but there are a bunch of other ones. So you'll see on the, the top left, there are vascular dementias. So somebody may develop dementia as a result of a stroke. Um, now, vascular dementia stands out just a little bit, if only because the damage is kind of done once, and then the person can, in many ways, rehab from that. Uh, and it may be the only form of dementia or one of the only forms of dementia where the, the person who is suffering from it may be able to um, uh, recover a little bit from it. And we'll talk a, a bit about cognitive reserve when we get to my portion at the end. Um, but there's a frontal lobe dementia, you'll see that on the top right, and that it deals with uh, judgment and reasoning. Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease is a prion disease, so it, it's analogous to like uh, 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 mad cow disease in, in bovines or chronic wasting disease in cervids. Uh, dementia can have, an, uh, I mean, uh, Parkinson's disease can have a dementia component to it. All of these look very different in different people, and they they look, uh, they all have their own diagnostic criteria, their own treatment criteria. Um, and so again, just to go back to my ice cream example, for someone to say that they have dementia is like telling you that they like Baskin Robbins. Well, what, what flavor do you like? And the same with dementia, what type of dementia? Because it can be very important to understand that, especially if you're, you're looking to uh, help connect people with resources or, or evaluate treatments or, or diagnosis. So just to kind of sum up, with aging, we may um, expect uh, that an individual's body and brain may gradually slow, but their, rel their, their, their intelligence remains relatively stable. And so again, these are things like vocabulary, uh, being able to reason, um, you know, but their their speed of processing may get a little slower. With mild cognitive impairment, which is kind of this catch-all term for 
um, changes in cognition that are noticeable, but they don't really interfere with day-to-day -day life. So, uh, you know, our, our independence is preserved, even though we may be a little less efficient with doing what we need to do. Um, you know, it, it's not really uh, uh, impairing our social or occupational function. And then there is dementia, which is a range of neurogenerative uh, disorders that are severe enough to cause uh, interference with day-to-day -day life. And so I mentioned previously, as we lead into Dr. Anding taking over our presentation, I mentioned previously that you know, our number one risk factor is still growing older, but there are some lifestyle factors that um, can affect us throughout our, our lifespan and put us potentially at greater risk. And some of these are controllable, um, such as tobacco use and uh, getting enough sleep and alcohol consumption, social isolation, things like that. Um, that we may be able to control. And then there are some things that may be able to decrease our risk, including healthy diet. And so with that, I will turn it over to Jenna to talk to us a bit about diet. Thanks, Andy. So before I get started, um, let's let's just chat about it for those of you that are that are on this webinar this morning. If you would type in the the chat box, and how, just tell me, how would you describe a typical American diet? If you want to describe your own diet, that's fine. If you want to describe your friend's diet, that's even, you know, as long as you're not throwing them under the bus. But what what is a typical American diet like to you? Okay. Ah, high fat, high sugar, fattening, quick and easy, overly processed, not balanced. A lot of highly processed, limited in fresh foods, skipping meals. Okay, so what I'm sensing is um, not very good, if that's um, a good summation of, of what we're seeing. Well, we know from research that there's a number of components in a healthy diet that might help prevent d dementia. And like Andy said, you know, I don't want you to leave this webinar thinking, well, if I eat more antioxidants, I won't get Alzheimer's or, or some of the other forms of dementia. We can't guarantee that. But there's a lot of things, as he said, that we can do to reduce our risk. And in, you know, researchers are looking at things like antioxidants, phytonutrients, healthy fats, and even certain B vitamins and, and the roles that they may play. When we think about antioxidants, and you know, we see a lot of antioxidants in vegetables and fruits, berries, whole grains and nuts. These antioxidants like vitamin C and beta carotene, selenium and zinc can uh, protect our body against free radicals and even reduce inflammation that might be in the body. And there's um, a lot of research out there to suggest that consuming a diet that is rich in these antioxidant rich foods may be associated with a reduced risk for Alzheimer's disease. Notice I said reduced, we're not talking cause and effect. Um, but one systematic review that was published in 2021 found an overall positive impact of antioxidant-rich plant foods and cognition. And, you know, spirit of full disclosure here, cognition can be assessed in a number of ways through surveys and tests. And so just put that to the side. But overall, diets that are rich in antioxidants may be beneficial for reducing our risk. Another component are some of these plant, these phytonutrients, sometimes they're called phytochemicals. And research has shown that these, these chemical components in many of our foods have both antioxidant and anti-inflammatory um, benefits. And one that's looked at quite a bit right now is polyphenols. 
And this is a category of phytonutrients. And we find them in berries. You're going to hear me say berries more than once in my session. Citrus fruits, colorful vegetables. Think green, and, and I'm talking dark green and red and orange. Um, green tea, um, some spices, nuts, cocoa, for those of you who like dark chocolate, you know, here's a plus for that. And then even red wine. Um, there's been some interesting research about the coca flavanols. They may help improve cognitive function in older adults. We're seeing a number of studies about blueberries and strawberries. Um, one study found that, you know, consuming strawberries at least once a week was associated with a reduced risk of Alzheimer. Um, a follow-up study in 2021 um, also found that older adults who were consuming um, 24 grams of freeze-dried strawberries a day for three months also had improved cognition. On the flip side, um, the red wine that is often touted for those polyphenols um, we've also seen that excessive alcohol consumption may not only increase our risk for dementia, but also other um, chronic diseases, most notably cancer. So there's that balance with alcohol intake where um, a little is probably okay, but too much can be detrimental to our health. Um, we often talk in the nutrition world about healthy fats and, and what we're talking about here are diets that are rich in omega-3 fatty acids, um, which we find from those, those fatty fish, flaxseed, walnuts, um, and there's a, a growing number of fortified foods now that have some omega-3 fatty acids. And those foods can help reduce inflammation, um, omega-3s have been linked with an increased risk, with a decreased risk for heart disease and certain autoimmune diseases. Um, research looking at omega-3s have shown um, a link between um, dietary intake of omega-3s and perhaps the slowing down of cognitive decline, but we don't know for sure if it's really a treatment or if it's going to prevent, but there, there's some association. So there's, there's probably something there. Um, on the flip side, diets that are high in saturated fats, omega-6 fats, you often find omega-6 fats in uh, some of our processed foods, um, trans fats, although we don't see trans fats too much in American diets anymore, um, but high intakes of those types of fats have been associated with poor cognitive and function, and, and maybe an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. Again, the jury is still out, but given the noted benefits of omega-3s and, and consuming those healthy fats, if not for preventing Alzheimer's disease, they could be beneficial for preventing other chronic diseases. And a lot of people don't like fish or maybe they don't have access to the fatty fish that are rich in those omega-3s. So you might think, well, I'll just take an omega-3 supplement, maybe a fish oil supplement. Unfortunately, um, the debate as to the benefits of fish oil supplements as it relates to dementia or cognitive decline is still out. Um, you know, we may see an increase in, you know, internal consumption or internal circulation of these omega-3 fatty acids, but we don't know for certain if there's um, really a, a link with decreased risk for Alzheimer's disease. B vitamins such as folate, B6 and B12, um, intakes of those can be beneficial because of a type of amino acid that's often found in the blood that's called homocysteine. And we know from research that high levels of this amino acid um, has been linked with not only an increased risk for heart disease, but as well as cognitive decline. So consuming diets that are rich in these B vitamins, um, and we're looking at everything from chickpeas, potatoes, bananas, um, you know, again, depending on the nutrient, um, spinach, peas, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, notice I'm really pushing the veggies here. Um, may be beneficial. Supplements, dietary supplements have been shown to reduce homocysteine levels, 
but have not been um, proven to be effective in preventing or even delaying the onset of dementia. So again, again, this is where the, the food versus supplement uh, debate continues. And as a dietitian, I'm, I'm pro food. There are some nutrients. B12 is one that as you get older, you may need a little bit more from a supplement or fortified foods. Um, but for the most part, if we could get our nutrients from food, that would be better. And then we're not going to get in too much here. I'll just say, but wait, there's more. Um, there's a growing interest and research looking at our gut microbiome, that's the bacteria that we find in our digestive tract and brain health. And so what we're finding is fruits and vegetables, fermented foods um, and plant-based protein can help promote the healthy bacteria in our gut. On the flip side, foods that are high in saturated fat, animal protein, those ultra refined carbohydrates and a lot of added sugars may be detrimental to our gut microbiome and they may change the type of bacteria that we find. So stay tuned as more information comes out, but it does lend um, more reasons to maybe consume more vegetables and fruits, whole grains, and less of those ultra processed foods. So we often get the question, okay, Jenna, what am I supposed to eat? Because we most of us don't eat nutrients. Um, we eat food, right? And so when we look at diets, and I'm not a big fan of diets, so I'm gonna call these eating styles. When we look at eating styles, um, what are our options here? One option is the DASH diet. DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. Um, this has been around probably 20 plus years. It was originally designed to promote healthy blood pressure. And the American Heart Association does encourage the DASH diet um, for individuals with, with mild hypertension. But if you look at the components of this diet, um, we're looking at eight to 10 servings of vegetables and fruits per day. Now, this is based on a 2,000 calorie diet. So if you need less, you, you don't need to eat eight to 10 servings, but your odds are you're going to eat more vegetables and fruits than you do now. Um, we're encouraging um, two to three servings of low fat dairy. We want to push the healthy fats, the mono, the poly, getting away from the saturated fats. Um, some grains are fine, six to eight servings. We want to encourage whole grains as opposed to those, those processed. No more than 23 milligrams of sodium. This is the equivalent of a teaspoon of salt. That's including what's in our food and what we add. And most of our sodium comes from processed foods, in, including canned foods. Um, DASH diet includes three to six servings of nuts a week and no more than five servings of sweets. So, you know, Halloween was yesterday. So if you've got any leftover Halloween candy around, um, you know, one piece of that is probably all you're going to get. Um, one tablespoon of jam, for example, is a serving of sweet. Um, so servings are really small when it comes to sweets. And what we have been shown is that the DASH diet does um, reduce systolic, diastolic blood pressure. It's been linked with lower risk of heart disease, improving insulin sensitivity, inflammation. And some studies have shown that it may have those neuroprotective benefits. Um, some studies show that the, consuming the DASH diet is linked with a reduced risk of cognitive decline other studies haven't found that, but I would argue that following the DASH diet because of the benefits that it has on blood pressure and promoting a healthy blood pressure, um, it could reduce our risk of that vascular dementia that Andy was talking about. So the next is the Mediterranean diet. Again, this is an eating style. There is no 
There's not a single Mediterranean diet like there is the DASH diet, but most of these um, eating styles in the Mediterranean area share very similar characteristics. And this has been a eating pattern that has been studied for more than 40 years with a lot of known benefits. Um, the characteristics of a Mediterranean diet share some uh, factors that are very similar to the DASH diet. We're looking at seven to 10 servings of vegetables and fruits a day. So we're balancing or we're basing most of our meals around vegetables, fruits, whole grain, olive oil, nuts, legumes, seeds, herbs and spices, but not salt. Sodium is, is kind of uh, reduced, similar to the DASH diet. Fish and seafood are consumed at least twice a week. Um, poultry, eggs, low and no fat cheese and yogurt are consumed in moderate amounts as are poultry and beef. Olive oil is used instead of butter or margarine, kind of cutting back on those saturated fats. Again, sugars and sweets, those highly processed carbohydrate foods, uh, those processed meats are eaten less often. Wine is consumed but only in moderation and if at all. It's not a license to go out and start drinking. Um, and if you do consume alcohol, that's fine, but just do it in moderation. And the dietary guidelines for Americans um, say that moderation is one drink for a female per day, no more than two for a male. And the amount varies whether it's wine or beer or um, a distilled uh, spirit. The Mediterranean diet has a number of benefits that have been shown over and over, um, has been linked with a reduced risk for diabetes, heart disease, inflammation. It may be associated with a reduced risk for memory problems and dementia. Um, in some populations, the Mediterranean diet has been shown to have to slower the rate of cognitive decline but other populations haven't seen that effect. And we'll talk a little bit about why we see sometimes what's conflicting information. Um, one study that was published in the United Kingdom, um, and this was a, a group of, I think it was about 900 adults, 55 years of age and older. They were studied for over a decade. And when they looked at their cognitive decline and their diet, what they found for, for this population was that, you know, consuming the fish and the fruit had the greatest impact on whether or not they experienced um, an increased risk for dementia. And then um, a systematic review that was published last year found um, they did confirm that following a Mediterranean style diet could reduce the risk of mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. Um, so again, other studies have shown, yes, there's some benefits. Other studies, maybe not so much, but um, I think what we're going to find is that, you know, populations are different and what works in one population may not work in all populations. But overall, the benefits of a Mediterranean style diet are, are there and they can re help reduce, I think, for many people, um, the risk for cognitive decline. Um, as well as some other diseases. And so the last diet um, style, eating style, that kind of, it burst on the scene in about 2015, is the Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurodegenerative delay, also called, called the MIND diet. And this is really a combination of the DASH and the Mediterranean style diets. Um, this is coming out of Rush University, um, there's a big emphasis on whole grains, leafy vegetables, nuts, and berries. Remember, you, I said earlier, you're going to hear me say berries more than once. And in 2015, which is when this diet came on the scene, they found, they, they studied a group of older adults. They were living in, um, I'm just going to call it an apartment style um, community, a senior community. They were preparing their own meals. They were able to choose their foods. But what they found was that individuals who followed this mind type diet were reducing their risk of Alzheimer's by as much as 35%. Um, 
And so there's still some more ongoing research. There's some clinical trials. Um, other studies that have looked at the MIND diet have suggested it may be linked with a reduced risk for depression. So that's pretty interesting. Again, the MIND diet has some, has some characteristics that are similar to the Mediterranean and the DASH diet, um, but they divide this into foods that you eat per day and per week. Um, per day, you wanna get at least three servings of whole grains, one serving of dark leafy greens. Notice the leafy greens are dark. We're talking about romaine lettuce, um, kale and spinach, not iceberg lettuce. Um, we're looking at other vegetables. I'm gonna push for the dark red, the orange. We're gonna get those beta carotene, those vitamin C, all those other great nutrients. I'm adding olive oil, um, not much butter or margarine, less than a tablespoon a day, and um, no more than one glass of wine or um, serving of alcohol. And and yes, pretty much the mine Mediterranean dash. This is a great question, Carrie. Um, the servings of fruits and vegetables are very similar. So yes, I would say for for ease, yes, let's treat them the way, the all the same way. Um, per week. Uh, they're looking at berries, five one half cup servings of berries. We're looking at blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, raspberries, and fresh or frozen are fine. Sometimes frozen is even better than the fresh, depending on where you live, um, the price, and the season that, that we're in. Looking at at least one serving of fish, two or more servings of poultry, pushing the legumes, three servings of beans, and a serving is only half a cup. Um, five servings of nuts. And I'm going to go one step further and say these probably should be unsalted and dry roasted. Um, and, and one ounce is not very much. We're looking at what can, for most people, unless you've got really huge hands, what can fit in the small amount of the palm of your hand. Up to two ounces of cheese per week, no more than four servings of sweets. You remember, we're trying to cut back on those added sugars and no more than one serving of fried or fast food. Now let's go back to when I asked y'all to type in the chat box about your characteristic of an average American diet. I saw several people type in fast food, quick, easy. And so cutting out the fried or fast food, going down to no more than one serving per week, might be tough for some people. And, and I'm just gonna say, if you eat fried foods or fast food four days a week, let's start by cutting it down to three and gradually work that uh, fried or fast food down to what's manageable for you. Hopefully no more than one serving a week. But like I said earlier, um, early research out of Rush University found that individuals who followed this style of eating could reduce their risk of Alzheimer's by as much as 35%. Um, one systematic review that was published in 2021 um, found that following the MIND diet was positively associated with certain aspects of cognitive function. Um, either it, it improved or it didn't decline. Um, and all three of these eating styles have been linked with a reduced risk for depression in some studies, not all. Um, and interesting, I, I have to mention this because la just last month, um, there was a paper published about the MIND diet. And they were doing, um, the researchers at Rush and Harvard, they, they just published this study where they compared, it was a three-year study of older adults they compared the MIND diet with um, just a low calorie, healthy diet. Both groups had dietitians that helped them with this eating pattern. Long story short, there wasn't a difference in cognition or brain MRIs over this three year period. Now, some people are going, well, does that mean the MIND diet didn't work? Um, one of the researchers who presented these results at um, a recent professional meeting commented that the control group had access to a dietitian on a regular basis. 
and they improved their diets. And so what they're thinking is one, three years is probably not long enough. And I would agree with that. But also maybe the people in the control group, even though they weren't supposed to follow the diet, the mind diet, I would suspect they probably adopted some aspects of the mind diet just by consuming a low calorie diet and losing the weight. And so there were some benefits. And the researchers behind the mind diet have said, even if you follow, you know, you don't have to follow it whole hog. If you follow it, you know, you know, to some extent, you're going to get some benefits. Um, I mentioned there's some limitations on the diet and the research and, you know, well, does it work? Does it not? Um, you know, we have to look at how dietary intake was measured, how often, um, you know, if, 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 I meant, if I measure somebody's diet when they're 50 and I don't measure their diet again until they're 70 or 75, there's a lot that went in between those 20 and 25 year periods. Um, some people change their diet, some people don't. So you have to look at that. There's all different ways that cognitive function is assessed, um, whether it's memory, processing, language, global cognition. And so you have to look at, you know, are some tests better than others? Um, have to look at the ages of the subjects in the studies. Some studies look at people who already have signs of mild cognitive impairment. Some people are looking at studies that have populations with no cognitive impairment. In other words, these are healthy individuals. And then there's um, some research research to suggest there may even be race and ethnic differences in how we react, how our bodies react to the different dietary components. Um, but all that aside, where do we start? You know, we're, we're feeding our brain. If, if you're my age and you're in your 50s and you're thinking about the next 20, 30 years, um, where do we start? Because some of this can be overwhelming. So what I would say is, if you follow a typical American diet, um, which research shows is not very healthy, let's start by increasing um, our vegetable and fruit intake, focusing on those dark red, orange, and green veggies. Um, try to include berries in your diet. The goal is five times a week, but hey, if you're not doing it at all, shoot for one and move up. Um, choose those healthy fats over the saturated trans fats. Try to get those omega-3s in. If you're not a fish person, look at other sources. Look at flaxseed and walnuts and fortified foods. Take a hard look at some of the highly processed refined carbohydrates and ask yourself, can I eat those a little less often? Um, again, we're looking at progress, not perfection. If you decide to wake up tomorrow and say, I'm going to throw out all the junk food and I'm only going to eat a healthy diet, that is great. But you may be setting yourself up for failure. What we know from research is this has to be done um, incrementally and because you want these habits to stick for the long term. So progress, not perfection. Um, and then last but not least, don't wait until you're older to start. The, the professional meeting that I was at in last month, and it was the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, I went to a number of sessions on aging and, and health and diet and how it impacts. And what I came away from that meeting is a lot of the things that we see as we get older are normal. Um, yeah, we may have aches and pains as we get older and maybe our joints ache, we have some overuse. A lot of it is not, you know, a disease. It's just a normal sign of aging. But what we do know is when you're entering in those adult, late adult years, and you've got chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, and those conditions are not under control, then you may be setting yourself up for cognitive decline as you get older. So if you've got some chronic diseases, let's work on getting those under control and in check. So don't wait until you're older to start. A lot of people just say, let me just take a pill. Can I just take a supplement? Long story short, they have not been shown to be effective. Um, 
There's a lot of stuff out there. Dietary supplements are not regulated the same way as prescription drugs. And even though you can buy it over the counter from, you know, any big box store, grocery store or online, um, there's really a, not a lot of control in what's going in those supplements. Um, supplements can interact with prescription medications. And so unless your doctor prescribes a particular supplement, I would say let's look at food as our uh, way of promoting cognitive decline um, and let's save our money for those healthier foods. So Andy, I'm going to turn it back to you so we can talk about self-care. Thanks, Jenna. I appreciate the, the information. So I mentioned briefly earlier about this idea of cognitive reserve. And, you know, one of the things that I think was interesting in the study Jenna mentioned about the trial of the mind diet versus a control diet with uh, individuals um, who just use some caloric restriction. And I think, Jenna, it was something simple. It was It was only about 250 calories a day. Uh, but one of the things that they also noted in that study is that the the participants were well educated. I think the average um, uh, years of education was something like 17 years of education. And there is this idea that there's some plasticity in our brains, that there's we can build capacity in our brain. So basically, when we are faced with cognitive decline, our brains can still work a way around being able to figure things out. And we can see that uh, demonstrated in, in individuals that that people who have, have spent a lifetime challenging their brain, keeping it active, um, may fare better uh, through cognitive decline, even with a diagnosis of some form of dementia, um, than people who haven't. And so just like, you know, with the, the dietary recommendations, it's not that you get your diagnosis today and you decide that you're going to change your eating patterns tonight. Um, you may reap some benefit from this, but this really is about a lifetime of engaging in these activities. And so one of the things that I would that I would commend to you as far as something that you could do for yourselves, but also for those you work with uh, and your kids and grandkids and, and anybody else you, you run into is to keep your mind active, to engage in stimulating activities. And that includes something like physical activity, which is important to keep vasculature and the brain healthy and that good supply of oxygenated blood um, uh, up there. And then also, you know, again, to engage in those educational and mentally stimulating activities. Another thing that's very important is, is not to be isolated and, 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 and lonely, um, and isolation and loneliness are distinct things. You know, isolation is, is objectively being alone and loneliness is kind of a subjective feeling of not, not being a part of a group, but both can be detrimental to our physical health, but also to our mental and emotional health. Uh, Jenna mentioned some of the diets um, associated with reducing a risk for depression. And it's interesting because one of the, the, the things that's, that, that memory research is kind of focusing on these days is less about the brain function, but more about how things like stress, anxiety, and depression can affect our memory and cause symptoms similar to uh, certain types of dementia. And so there have been studies that show uh, older adults, um, you know, complain about memory problems and say memory is affecting their lives, but really when they're they're put to an objective cognitive skills test or other objective testing uh, to look for cognitive decline, the evidence isn't there. And so there's increasing work showing that stress, anxiety, depression uh, can uh, cause memory issues in older adults, but those are solvable. You know, those are easily treated with various types of therapies or or looking at ways to, say, reduce stress or better manage stress. And so, you know, one of the ways that we can combat that is to not um, uh, be isolated, to engage in social activities. We are human animals. We need um uh, companionship, we need intimacy, we need socialization with others. And so, you know, another thing to, to take away from this, in addition to keeping your mind active, is to engage in even the simplest form of 
of uh, human interaction is to have a conversation with somebody. And also in that you're having to actively listen and respond to what somebody is saying. So you're thinking on your feet, you're stretching your brain, uh, that speed of processing part of your brain that may tend to decline uh, as we go grow older. And you don't have to talk about, you know, nuclear proliferation or something high level. You can, you know, share something you read or or what happened on the soap opera that day or something, but just have a conversation with someone and, and listen and respond uh, to what they're saying. Um, there are some types of cognitive retraining, and we're going to go through some of them. Uh, they basically fall into three big buckets, memory, reasoning, and speed of processing. And there are a lot of uh, apps and, and websites and things out there that'll, it'll, uh, uh, take your money in order to engage in these activities. And I think if if you choose to do that, um, you know, go for it because some of those trainings uh, are are really good at, at helping you with your self-efficacy, feeling better about what you do and how you do it, decreasing your anxiety. And then, you know, you also can get some, some benefit from interacting with other people to help solve issues. But you can also go to your local dollar store and pick up a, a puzzle book or, um, you know, some of the kids magazines where you find Waldo and things like that uh, to, to accomplish this on your own. But the important thing is just to find an activity that you enjoy um, and and try to make it challenging. I heard somebody say play bridge, not bingo. And maybe that is good advice, but you know, you could also just figure out a way to make bingo more challenging. Uh, you know, use the the dauber in your non-dominant hand or turn your card upside down so that you're having to to think through how to how to get your numbers right. Just don't call a, a false bingo. So before we get to my first memory uh question for you. I did ask you at the very beginning of the session, and again, I'll know if you cheated and you wrote it down. What were the three words that I asked you to remember? All right. Good. Good. Oh, Jenna. Good. All right. I'm 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 good. Yeah. House, lake, and shoe. Um, and that's just a, a quick little uh, memory test, right? And you actually find something like that in some of the cognitive skills testing that's used to diagnose various forms of dementia, where they'll give you some random words that they want you to remember, and then on, they'll engage you in something else, and then come back to you here in a bit to um, to uh, see if, if you remembered them. And so something like this could be the same. So I'm going to leave this picture up for about 10 seconds, and I want you to try to remember as many things on this picture as you can. So that was 10 seconds. It's not very, not very long when you, uh, when you try to, to uh, think of something, but you know, this is the type of exercise that you can do on your own. You know, you open a magazine and you see this beautiful um, holiday tablescape and you, you, you tell yourself, I'm going to try to remember 15 things about this and then turn the page and then, you know, turn back to the page and see how well you did. Um, and, and so We'll see how well you did. I'm going to put it back up there while I reassure Diana. No, don't worry. Um, one thing that's important about um, uh, cognitive testing is that it needs to be multidimensional. So one of the things that has shown with some of the, the battery tests that are done with cognitive skills is, you know, people score differently for different reasons. So for instance, you know, the, the, a lot of the, the cognitive tests were uh, built assuming that um, you're a non, you're a native speaker of English or that you have a, a high school education or any number of other uh, assumptions. And they've actually gotten a lot better with trying to make them more diverse. So even with this example on the screen, you know, some of these things may not have context in other cultures or, uh, you know, with non-native speakers. You know, for instance, just to the right of memory, there's what I would call a peppermint stick, but somebody may see that as a cane or maybe it's a fishing hook. So, you know, any diagnosis of anything needs to be multi-level, multi-dimensional. Um, but I would also say that if you're worried about memory issues, be sure that you're sharing that with your health provider. Um, I won't ask anybody to, to share, but 
hopefully some of you were able to do pretty good with remembering some of the things that were on your screen um, with your memory. Here's another one. This is a good one. Uh, which one's the penny? And, and this is an example of something that, um, you know, doesn't require any specialized knowledge or skill, right? I mean, how many times have you found a penny, picked it up, and all the day you had good luck? Um, it really is just causing your brain to kind of think through um, what it already knows to, to retrieve information that is in your memory. So does anybody have a guess about which one is the real penny? You got some I's and O's. Oh, we're all over the place. A lot of them. It is a, Carolyn, if I had a prize for you, I would give it to you, but I don't. Um, but uh, yep, penny A is what a real penny is. But even just to think that, you know, you're you're sitting in your office and you you come up with something like this and and use a coin, use a nickel, use a quarter, use a dime, uh, whatever you want, and just try to to think through which way are they facing? What lettering is on there? Does it say in God we trust or does it say e pluribus unum? You know, uh, what what is on uh, that? It, just to, to flex your brain a little bit and make your memory work. Another type is um, reasoning. And so in reasoning, we're kind of, of uh, puzzling through something. So uh, in this example, on the first line, we're trying to figure out what the watermelon is. Uh, and in this instance, the watermelon is, anybody got an idea? The watermelon is 12, that's right. And so in the next example, we're doing the watermelon plus two oranges equal 28. So we know the watermelon is 12. Uh, 28 minus 12, I'm terrible at math, I think is 16. And then we divide 16 by two and we get uh, eight. And then uh, the watermelon minus the bananas, eight minus the banana is three. So the banana equals five. So we're, we're putting that reasoning into practice. Again, we're not needing high level things here. We're just trying to reason out a solution and we can do that through games. So I actually like playing Sudoku, Sudoku a lot. Uh, but you're reasoning what the numbers will be based on the other conditions around them. You can do something like that with the nutrition facts label. Jenna just did a lot of, of great information about how much of things you should be doing. And so, you know, if you're trying to reduce the sodium, you can figure all of that out on the on the the label. Um, so play games with yourself like that. Challenge your brain. Um, make it make it work. Uh, for you, but you can do this with ordinary everyday things. With processing, it gets a little more challenging, but this would be something like uh, the match game, you know, where you put cards out and you have to, to figure out which one is which. That also engages your memory. It's also uh, skills. So if I asked you to, to uh, uh, add those numbers on the screen, you could probably do it. But I, if I asked you to do it while reciting the months of the year out loud, you'd probably have a little bit of a challenge there because your brain isn't focused on any one task. You know, the processing is kind of divided, but uh, helping keep your brain active in that way um, is, is really important um, just for that speed of, of processing. And so don't, don't make yourself kind of uh, anxious and stressed out by trying to do multiple things at the same time, but do challenge your brain so that uh, you're keeping that, that speed of processing uh, up in fluid. Um, I'll, I'll leave you one more and then I'm going to do the key takeaways. Okay. This will be another memory thing for you. How many states in the United States begin with the letter M? And when you got a number, just put it in the chat and I'm going to run through the key takeaways. So our key takeaways today are, are not all memory issues or dementia. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is the most common type, but it's not the only one. Uh, you know, working to improve our diets by incorporating those uh, leafy greens, fruits and vegetables, especially berries, um, and and decreasing some of the, the bad things like sugar, uh, sodium, 
Um, moderating our alcohol consumption is going to be very important. Keeping our physical activity up just so that we're improving our overall health as well as our brain health, adopting healthy habits, um, you know, being with other people so that we get that socialization and, and keeping our brain active throughout our lifespan. Uh, did anybody get 12 states in the United States that begin with the letter M? Good, because there are only eight. Um, their main uh, Maryland, Massachusetts, Mississippi, uh, Missouri, Michigan, and Montana. Thank you for your time today. We'll hang on for just a little bit to answer any questions you have, and uh, I will turn it back over to Rachel. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Jenna, as well. Dr. Andy, you did a great job. Um, just to reiterate, for a copy of today's presentation slides, resources, CE information, which I'll briefly go over here shortly, um, all of this is on the event page. I went ahead and posted that link. Um, there is a box that says event materials that has the PowerPoint slides and resources. There's a section that's on CE credit and certificates of completion. That is going to be a purple button that appears. Click on that button. You will be required to complete a survey before then identifying which CE offering you are interested in. We have a variety of CE credits available throughout today um, that's available not only for the live event, but also on the recorded version as well. So if you've missed a portion of today's presentation, or if you know someone that's missed it, there is CE offerings um, once the recording is posted that folks can, can watch and still get CE credits for and certificates. But we are offering um, board certified patient advocate, case manager, certified family life educated, a, excuse me, educator, certified in family consumer sciences, nutrition and wellness educators, our registered dietitian nutritionists, um, key thing here is, is if you attended today's live event, we are approved for CDR credit for just the live event, not the recording just yet. So if you attended the live event, that CE offering is available. Um, social workers, LPCs, LMFTs, there is one CE credit as well for you. And then if those of you that are just needing a certificate of completion um, to submit to your supervisors, we have that option as well. So thank you everyone for attending. Hans, where is the button for CEs? Um, maybe you have to refresh your page. So if you go ahead and refresh the website, um, there should be a continuing education button that pops up near the CE and certificate section. Um, also, as our year is starting to fly by, I can't believe it's already November 1 today, um, we are having our final webinar of 2023 um, for caregiving or lifespan caregiving. And so register for that webinar. It's ethics and action concepts, practice and context um, for providers. That webinar is really going to delve into the realm of eth ethics and professional practice um, for those that are professionals dedicated to enhancing that family readiness and well-being within that military setting. So stay tuned December 6th, mark your calendar um, for that final lifespan caregiving webinar of 2023. Get connected with all of our upcoming events, articles, and resources at oneop.org. Um, so we have lots of webinars throughout the year, um, as well as online courses, CE credits, um, as it relates to nutrition and wellness, personal finance, family development, lifespan caregiving, military children. Um, so oneop.org. We're going to hang on for about a minute for you to gather any final um, links or if you have any questions for the presenters. And um, we'll hang on for about a minute and then we'll go ahead and close out. But thank you all for attending today and thanks so much for your time and your participation in that chat. Hope you have a great rest of the week.